Can you hear me now? Great. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for, for making it through the freezing cold February morning. We're really, really happy to have you all here. Um, I just want to say a few words before we get into the thick of it, because we've got a lot to talk about. This is going to be a fast-moving couple of hours. There's a lot of stuff for us to cram into this time. And I'm only going to ask one thing of you, and that is be here. Be in the room. Pop those phones underneath your leg. Just for two hours, trust me, that inbox, that little social media feed, it's going to be there in two hours. And I guarantee you that at the end of these two hours, you will feel different and you will be changed. That's why I need you to be here. I need you to vest yourself into what we are talking about today because it's going to move at pace. First, I want to thank everybody that has made this possible, and that's obviously where we are sitting now in this incredible Tishman Auditorium, uh, and to thank the, the New School and Parsons School of Design and everybody involved, especially the incredible technical team, Mark and Michael and everything, and Vladimir and everything that they have done for us. Um, I want to thank AIGA, who have partnered with us and given us some scale and scope here. That's been really important. And then, of course, I want to thank Dezine. And Dezine, just so you're probably aware, if you read your emails earlier, that we have the incredible Hassan team who have come all the way from Finland uh, to help us, to support us on this mission. And they are filming this for Dezine, and this will be uh, going out and streamed to a few, we hope, 100,000 people afterwards. So I want to thank Dezine as well. I'm very proud, actually. Um, they've just asked me to be a judge on their award scheme, worth checking out what they're doing with their awards. I think every, every award scheme right now is elevating itself to having perhaps different metrics, different measurements of what does creativity mean today. And first, what I want to do is pull us out, pull us right out to looking at some of the incredible images. It's very easy for us to think nature is maybe a local park or the ocean. But actually, when you look at these incredible photographs that have been taken now by the James Webb Telescope, it has empowered us to see that nature is so much bigger than we ever imagined. Nature isn't just what happens on planet Earth. Nature is what happens in this universe. And these pictures enable us to have a very different perspective a different perspective on our relationship, not just with planet Earth, but our place with everything. We are made of atoms, the same atoms. We are made of stardust. We momentarily borrow this stardust to make ourselves as human beings, to create the world that we, that we inhabit. This photograph, when it first came out, was considered so powerful, it was actually withheld because they thought that it would change the way that we see our place in the world. We need to change the way we see our place in the world. We need to look with new eyes. And how are we going to do that? How are we going to create this incredible future that is actually happening right now, today? We can't do it alone. And so this session, these couple of hours, is largely going to be about us coming together. It's about collaboration. It's about what happens when 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 25, because just as you think of the factor of magnification of the James Webb Telescope, that's what happens when people come together, particularly creative people, which is why we're here today. It's easy for us to think that the future just happens. It doesn't. We've got to remember that. We make our future. We have this extraordinary power. And we also have a hell of a lot of answers. And yet we're still talking about the problems. Personally, I hate talking about the problems. I only want to think about what is this new future going to look like? How can we create that vision and then build a roadmap to it? Some months ago, I was invited to be part of a workshop um, by, run by an organization called Reckit. And the global head of brand experience for Reckitt is about to share some words with you. And I don't know about you, but I've heard climate science scientists tell us a little bit about what, you know, the doom and gloom, the Armageddon of 2030. I've never heard somebody who's actually right in the heart of the problem deliver the hard facts to us. So I'm going to give you a little health warning. 
that the next section is not going to be happy. It's not going to make you feel great. It is deliberately to terrify you because we need to be scared, but then we need to realize that we have options, we have solutions, we have answers, and therefore we have hope. So don't feel it's all going to be doom and gloom, but we're going to start with a reckoning of our true reality, and I want to introduce to the stage Joss Harrison from Wreck It. Thank you. So I'm here today to talk about the impact that we have as creatives, as engineers, as scientists. The, the collective incredible skill sets that we use to imagine and to create the future. And it's a future that we share as a species as part of a, a mutually dependent biome. But I'm not here today in my capacity as a designer. I'm here to talk to you as a member of the FMCG industry. So FMCG, Fast Moving Consumer Goods, or CPG, Consumer Packaged Goods, it's an industry that has played a, a huge part in contemporary society. Um, through its products, its advertising, and its partnerships with retailers. But what part has it played? Well, it's coached us over the course of 100 years or so that consumption is, is OK, it's right, that waste is acceptable, that immediacy is a reasonable expectation, and that Convenience is king. Now, many other industries have a similarly short-term perspective, but this industry, my industry, has coached a mindset, an attitude, a societal norm that has ultimately resulted in a lack of care, a diminishing of concern for our collective impact on our own life support system, the planet itself. So I'd like to start our time together today by providing you with some context to get a sense of the situation that we find ourselves in. And I have to credit Dr. Hugh Montgomery of University College London uh, for many of the statistics that you'll see in, in this presentation. So let's start with water. Our industries, brands, operating categories that, um, in many cases, are conscious users and, in some cases, conservers of water. But as fresh water becomes scarce, as we already see in many geographies, our products, our brands, their categories, even the human behaviors that enable them, become compromised. And the industrial processes and raw materials extraction that we see in, in many industries have contributed to a, an enormous overconsumption of water. We're essentially borrowing from a future water fund that can't support our needs. And sadly, that's a theme you'll see recurring throughout this talk. Now, many of us are unaware, there we go, many of us are unaware that topsoil erosion is even a thing or that it has an enormous effect on habitat, habitat change. And what we tend not to realize is the huge impact this has on our food supply. Whether you're a, a meat eater or a vegetarian, your nutrition is dependent on plants, and plants need topsoil to grow in. So what happens in 20 years or so when there's none left? And this links to the equally drastic deforestation that we see around the world. Most noticeably in the so-called lungs of the planet, equatorial rainforests. Forests which once were able to absorb and to process and to trap enormous volumes of carbon dioxide, as well as harboring amazing biodiversity. Not any longer. They're being cut down at a rate that makes them irreplaceable. 
we simply can't regrow them quickly enough to prevent the mass extinction and immediate CO2 release that's being caused. And that mass extinction leads to a vast reduction in biodiversity, the impact of which we still don't fully understand. So the recent pandemic was an example of something called zoonotic diseases. So organisms that are able to transfer from animals to humans due to a combination of proximity and the ability of the disease to evolve much more rapidly in animal populations that have ever decreasing genetic diversity thanks to our claiming their habitats. Now, I'd just like to take a moment to get you to consider this, this point on the slide behind me. Many of us think of, of creatures with backbones as the, the real wildlife of this world, when in fact they could be our livestock, our food, even our pets. And in the last 50 years, that's within my lifetime, we've killed off more than two thirds of the most advanced life forms on this planet. And unfortunately, this impact is not limited to vertebrates. Our habitat destruction and environmental degradation through many industrial processes and, and waste has an enormous impact. Our oceans were once a bastion of biodiversity, a place that even we couldn't reach with our harmful influence as, as humans. Unfortunately, we've proven we're just as able to damage that environment as we are on land. So from the sea to the sky, carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas emissions. Where do I even start with this one? This is the ultimate destructive human behavior because the net effect of all these gases is to trap heat energy in our atmosphere. Now, if, like me, we've got people in here from Northern Europe, you might think that slightly warmer temperatures is not such a bad thing, I wouldn't mind. But what we'll actually get is increasingly severe weather systems that have an enormously disruptive effect on food supplies and travel. We can also expect rising sea levels, as I'm sure you've heard, alongside drying out of huge areas of land and vegetation, leading in turn to ever greater and more frequent forest fires, which, of course, release yet more greenhouse gases and particulate matter. And the problem with these greenhouse gases and their warming effect is that it's not something we can escape anytime soon. Can they hang around for a long time? I mean, really long time. We're talking tens of thousands of years holding that heat energy, amplifying all of the existing warming and drying effects. And this results in, frankly, terrifying sea level rise. This continuous heat, uh, heating action is already melting polar ice caps. And all of that ice melting, of course, is releasing huge volumes of fresh water into our oceans around the world, which is disrupting ocean currents and raising sea levels at, frankly, an alarming rate. Now, this rise in sea levels has a simple and stark result. Less land to live on. Less land to grow crops, to feed populations. Less space for us. Now, the sea level rise, combined with the habitat destruction through fire and other natural disasters, is literally taking away our living space. And not in any small measures. One-fifth of human habitable space will be gone within the next 30 years. That's irreversible harm on a planet-changing scale in our lifetimes. Which means that humans will be displaced, or worse, killed, by the effect of our own relentless growth mindset. And, as ever, the worst affected will be the poorest, the most marginalized, the underprivileged and underrepresented. 
leaving, of course, the extremely wealthy to continue protected, continue with all the same behaviours that contributed to some of these problems that we face. So, it's clear that we need to accept that there is a, a change from our historical rhetoric of reduce, reuse, recycle, which places the onus on the individual to do their bit in cleaning up our planet. Instead, we have to acknowledge that societal change is needed, a change that encompasses both behavioral and attitudinal elements, which is scary, right? Especially when you see facts like these on screen, it can feel like it's an insurmountable challenge. And it's easy to feel that as, as individuals, we can't make a difference. But as a collective, we absolutely can. So, I want to start us off today by thinking about the behaviours that we need to change and the attitudes that we need to shift. And let's get ourselves in the, the right mindset for the rest of these talks by acknowledging that the, the behaviours and the attitudes, the conventions that got us here, cannot continue. We can't keep building new ways to enable consumption. And in fact, consuming stuff can't be the thing that defines us. We're not consumers, we're people. So, let's consider the role of designers and creatives and engineers and scientists, these creative minds, in reimagining the future of our brands, our categories, our industry. And if we're to future-proof our brands and our businesses, we need to acknowledge that the world of FMCG and CPG that we've helped to create doesn't have a future in its current state. We've contributed to a culture that expects everything now with utmost convenience and, frankly, minimal concern about waste. But it's a culture that is rapidly eroding and it's soon going to disappear. So businesses like ours, industries like ours, have to be able to change, have to adapt, because it will soon be unacceptable to ship millions of consumer units or food across continents, or to manufacture objects that contain mostly water and ship those across continents. It'll soon be unacceptable to use aerosols to dispense things or to use any kind of plastic in packaging. So this culture of mindless consumption is the past. We have to reimagine what the future should look and feel like. So, the message today is to think big, think bold, and think brave. Because the future that we're imagining is our future. With all of its inherent barriers and pitfalls and difficulties. And that future must be one where your ideas as creatives make a disproportionate contribution to a safe, sustainable, and equitable future for all life on this planet. Thank you. So I'm going to hand back to Sean. We're going to hear a bit more from Joss later on a panel where we're going to be talking about some really big questions of, is he a man of words or is he a man of action? Because what I've witnessed already in what he's doing is, at wreck it, what he's trying to do is reinvent that entire business, a big FMCG company from the inside out. So the climate crisis, what's that got to do with plastic? I hear this all the time. You know, surely we just need to, we can worry about the waste, the pollution, what we've done to the oceans, we can worry about that further down the road. Because right now, it's about emissions, it's about carbon, this is the problem. So while we're talking about telling the truth and laying things bare, let me connect for you absolutely intrinsically 
the climate crisis and the plastic crisis. Because for me, the plastic crisis and the reason we're so laser sharp focused on it is it is that canary in the coal mine. We think that it is something that, oh, it's lightweight. Anybody in packaging design, oh, it's really hard to improve on plastic because it's so light, it's so light on carbon. Look at just how massive, as a country, the plastics industry is, the fifth biggest emitter of greenhouse gases. So let us not pretend when we think about just the weight of these little bits of PET that that's the metric that we should care about. But the other reason for me that we should be so obsessed about plastic being the gateway to us fixing the climate crisis is this. One material was invented that empowered us, enabled us to change and break that system of take from nature, make something, reuse it, repair it, refill it, rent it, all of these things to take, make, chuck it in a bin for some magical, mythical recycling fairy to do something with it. So I'm not going to talk about the problem of plastic because I think you guys already know that. Otherwise, I don't know where you've been, but we have a massive problem and it's on track to treble. And it's very easy for us to think that plastic, because we've grown up with it, it's everywhere. It's in the paint on our walls. It is literally everywhere. It's in every lungful of air that we're breathing in right now. It's in that glass of water. It's in that beer I'm going to have later on tonight. So we have infected every single inch of our planet with plastic. And it's easy for us to think that it's a material that is a little bit like, I don't know, copper or iron. It's not on the periodic table. It's a mixture of chemicals, many of them toxic. And the other thing about plastic is we talk about circularity, like we, we've invented this new thing called circularity in materials, and we're really trying to shoehorn plastic into it because it would be so convenient if we could say that plastic is circular. It doesn't fit into any kind of circular model. And many of you will have seen this graphic that's been around for a long time now when we talk about here we are for decades we've been we've been living in this linear economy and that's obviously ending in that big trash can at the bottom and then we tried this thing called the recycling economy we're still really in that phase um, but then we talk a lot about the circular economy like we've invented this new thing but you will note there's still a problem with the circular economy there's still a bin albeit a bit smaller and the reason for that is this that when we talk about circularity right now, we talk about taking things from nature, and then we make things with them. But because we're man, we somehow we've got this slightly wrong, we toxify them. You take something like skin, you know, to make leather, we tan it, chromium, heavy metals, the dyes, the stuff that is used to make leather is unbelievably toxic. So we take something from nature that is fundamentally a nutrient, we toxify it, and then we give it back even if we recycle it a couple of times, it's going to end up being some kind of toxic going back into nature. Because everything that we give back to nature is either a food or a poison. And we're still stuck in this whole little track of giving back poison. So imagine if we had a different model of circularity, which is actually nature's infinite cycle, which is based on nutrients. There is no waste in nature. Everything becomes the nutrients of the next growth cycle. Again and again and again, infinitely. Unlike the six billions tons of trash that we humans give back to nature, there is no waste in nature. So this is where we need to get to. Imagine if we could create materials that could slip in to nature's supply chain in that way. So anybody who's in the world of materiality or making things be it a T-shirt, a bottle, a building, anything, then I'd love you to just have that little thought of provocation in your mind. Ask that manufacturer one question. Is it chemically modified? Because trust me, that one question sorts the wheat out from the chaff. Because as soon as somebody says, well, we have to do such and such and such, you, you know, you have suddenly created something that is no longer a food, for nature, a nutrient for nature, but is a poison for nature. And later, we're going to be talking about how we can do this at scale today, because everything today that we're going to be talking about is our incredible future crossed out now. 
But it's not just about the way that we make materials that is the problem, that plastic has given us this incredible gateway and awareness into. It's the fact that we take too much. And many of you, I'm sure, have heard of Earth Overshoot Day, 28th of July last year. That was the day we had taken what we were entitled to that year. We'd taken from nature everything we were entitled to. And everything beyond that, we were just borrowing. And imagine this fact. I only heard this recently, and it blew my mind. In the last six years, we've used more natural resource than in the entire 20th century. It, just in the last six years. So we're doing this. We're borrowing the resources from the future. We're using them today to make more stuff. We're taking the resources from our children and our grandchildren, and we're calling it growth. We're calling it GDP. We're hiding behind these words. So the other question that I would love you to consider, if you're a business owner, if you're working in the world of design, creativity, anything, ask yourself this question. Does your business, that project, that brand that you're working on, does it push back Earth Overshoot, Earth Overshoot Day? Because if the answer is yes, you are a future success story. And if the answer is no, then you are a future dinosaur. We think the future is unpredictable. You know, you talk to insurance people, you talk to CEOs, and they'll say, yeah, you know, we're hedging our bets, we really don't know. I guarantee you the future we've got right now is 100% predictable. We know these things are happening. More climate devastation, fewer resources, a lot less dependency, we hope, on fossil fuels. This is the future ahead of us. So you need to ask yourself, if you work within the world of business, if you're entering the world of business, if you're a creative of any kind, can you afford not to be ready for a very predictable future? Because right now, we work with people, and you, you tell, they are squeezing every last drop out of the status quo, every last drop of profit, because they know they are going to be a future dinosaur. My background is that of an entrepreneur, so I believe passionately that we can't wait for governments, much as we work with governments in the UN, we can't wait for them. We can't wait for this mythical, ethical consumer to rise up in sufficient volumes to actually demand the change. Why is it our problem? Business is the real tool of change. And this is where we have to focus. But who are the people? Who is the massive industry that historically has ignited and created this incredible vision of a different future, has provoked business to behave in a different way, then I think it's you, the creative industries. They have always been the ones to pull the rest of humanity forward. And it, it strikes me how strange it is that business schools get all the attention when creative schools, they're the ones that governments need to be listening to that people need to be really empowering and f funding in a completely different way. Because you have the power to hold a vision, and people of business mainly don't. So my provocation is this. Let's think of the plastic crisis. It's nothing to do with pollution. It's nothing to do with waste. It is fundamentally a design problem. It's a production problem. But actually, what we can also consider it is a gift. It's that little tap on the shoulder to say, hey, you've gone down the wrong cul-de-sac here. This is toxic. It's indestructible. This is going to be the death of humanity as we know it. So think of it as this gateway into us fixing so much else. It really is this defibrillator Solid fossil fuels, plan B for the fossil fuel industry. But it is acting as this de defibrillator to wake us all up. Because I don't know about you, but I feel guilty. I feel angry and scared and guilty about what we have done to nature and now to ourselves with our addiction to this toxic and indestructible material. So this is our wake-up call that I know if we fix the plastic crisis, we will directly and indirectly fix so much else. Because remember, it is the key to hyperconsumption that enabled us to break the model and make things so cheaply we could use them once and throw them away. And what has hyperconsumption caused? The climate crisis. 
But I think people need new tools. We've become acutely aware from working with industry and then also working a lot through our organization of Plastic Planet, working a lot with the new materials makers, the system changers. And we became acutely aware of this kind of knowledge gap because things are moving so fast now, particularly in the world of materials and systems, they're moving so fast that how can the creative industry keep up? And if you go and have a look and you try and do some research, I don't know, you go to Google, and it's like going to Niagara Falls for a glass of water, and you don't even know if it's clean, because so much greenwash, so much misinformation out there. But imagine if you had a new tool. And imagine if 160 million creatives, apparently that is the number of the creative industry at large. And I think it's even bigger, because for me, if you're an entrepreneur, that's the most creative thing you can ever do, is start something from nothing. So 160 million creatives who've got the ability to create a vision of a new future, imagine if they rose up to reimagine our world in a different way. This, good people, is your new tool. Plastic Free, we are here today in the wonderful city of New York, launching a new design tool, a platform that will empower, ignite, engage, educate the 160 million global creatives, connecting them with these materials of the future, but even more fundamentally, the system change of the future that we need, led by an extraordinary design and science council, rich with content, editorial pieces, case studies, proof points, designed by creatives for creatives. So we hope that this is going to be one of the tools in the, in the armory of, of new instruments that you need in order to create this new incredible future now. Because design and creativity has always been that foot on the pedal. It's always been the thing that pulls everything forward. It's never been economic models and new businesses and the world of money. It's been the visionaries. Designers have the have the power to change everything. This is why we're here in the Parsons School of Design, in this auditorium, because this is where this tool belongs and this is where the power is. And we have to come and talk to the power and work with them. But please, stop thinking that you don't have any power. Stop thinking that it's all just going to be inevitable, that that bleak future that Joss painted for us so vividly, that this is inevitable that there's nothing that we can do about it. The future is created, and it's created by you. But we need to move fast. We've been just treading water for way too long. We've got to move from these things. I'm so bored. I'm sorry if anybody here is from McKinsey or Bain or anybody else, but I'm so bored of the theory. We know already, but we've got to move to action. Things are far too slow. Everybody here needs to be on the bus. You used to drive the bus. Are you on the bus? Get back in the driving seat. Humanity needs you now. Everybody in this room has the capability, the skills, to be this wrecking ball of change that is already in play. As I say, this is not about the future. This is about today. And if you aren't a wrecking ball of change, then where are you? Who are you? 
because I want to make sure that our tool and everything that you learn today takes you up, elevates you to a whole new level of empowerment and excitement to embrace this new future, own it, be part of it, and fundamentally, don't get left behind. Thank you. And now we're going to bring it right down to earth. Literally, the earth. Because you might have heard Joss, you know, just talking uh, about some of those stats around soil, the importance of soil. And I, I, I don't know if anybody's seen that film, Kiss the Ground, amazing film. A bit cheesy, but amazing film. And there is one phrase I'll never forget, and it is somebody holding a handful of soil and saying, in this handful of soil, there are more living organisms than human beings have ever inhabited planet Earth. And how do we treat it? This quote, I think, says it all. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome to the stage somebody who's going to talk to us about this fundament that is so vital, Austin Thorson. Hello, um, my name is Einstein Thorsen. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I'm the CEO of a company called FAI, uh, and we work with brands primarily in the food sector to help them realize agricultural systems that are positive for people, animals, um, and the environment. And I'm here today to talk about how soil is um, the solution to our incredible now. Um, and how regeneration as a principle is probably our best hope for an incredible future. So what is soil? Um, soil is the foundation of life on Earth. It's a thin layer of organic and inorganic material that cover about 10% uh, of our planet. And it's the start of literally all life. It's home to the most diverse ecosystem we have on this planet. 25% of the planet's biodiversity exists in soil, yet we know only about 1% about this incredible universe that sustains the health of plants and ourselves. So I brought a little prop here, which I hope um, you can pass around. So, um, as Sean just said, in every gram of soil, there is more life organisms than there are people uh, on the earth right now. Uh, and obviously in that glass that I'm passing around, um, there's probably as many people, as, um, as much life as we've had on, on the earth uh, at people uh, for the last, well, as long as we've been here. So smell it, touch it. Um, and think about the incredible kind of web of, of life that is in, uh, is in that dirt uh, below us. So let's start with why, um, why this incredible network of living organisms is important to us. So it starts with the, starts with the food. 95% of the food that we eat is directly or indirectly grown uh, in soil. But soil is more than, it's more than dirt. It's more than a medium in which plants grow. It's the actual source of the macro and micronutrients. So nitrogen, potassium, zinc, the, the, the micronutrients the plants need to be healthy and that we need to be healthy. There's a direct, a direct link. It's through that amazing web of bacteria, fungi, plant roots that these minerals are mined from the soil and made available to us through plants or through animals who eat those plants and then we eat the animals. Beyond providing food, um, which is a you know, pretty incredible feat uh, in and of itself. Let's see. Um, here we go. 
soil is critical to a whole suite of, of, of important aspects of, of our lives, so starting with the, with the water cycle. Uh, soil filters, cleans, holds water uh, that we need for pretty much everything uh, we do. Um, soil is critical to grow a whole variety of, of fibers and materials that we've talked about earlier and we'll hear more about uh, later today. They can be used in in pretty much any material industry um, there, there is, often in place of plastics. Soil is a vital component of the natural carbon cycle. Um, it extracts carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, pulls it into the soil through an incredible technology uh, known as photosynthesis and the breaking down of dead stuff. Soil is the largest reservoir of, um, of carbon uh, in, in the world, and it has the potential to store much more if we, if we take care of it. You might say the, the solution we talked about, the solution to climate change is right below our feet, and it's farmers and stewards of the land who are uh, the key to unlocking that. So as you can see up here, there's lots of other, lots of other benefits to, uh, to healthy soil. I'm not going to uh, talk about them all today. And I wish that this was the end of my talk, that uh, we could say, congratulations, pat on the back, humanity. You have taken care of soil, you have valued it, and therefore we are fine. Uh, unfortunately, as we've heard already, uh, not quite the truth. Um, we've been to enough talks like this before to know um, that it doesn't end here. Um, soil is under threat from a variety of different um, human activities, primarily. So imagine this, since 1960, we have uh, more than doubled the human population. We have more than tripled our food production um, in that period, but the use of agricultural land has only increased 15%. So there's been an incredible agricultural revolution happening since 1960. And that's been made available through a variety of, of technologies from genetics to, um, to fossil fuels. Uh, heavy machinery, fertilizers, pesticides has driven a production revolution that while it's managed to provide ever, ever cheaper calories to an ever-growing population, it's come at an incredible price and now is threatening the, the life source itself, is threatening the soil. In that same period, we've lost a third of the fertile soil available to us. So instead of patiently fostering um, Instead of patiently fostering uh, soil health, we've in some ways kind of uh, waged chemical warfare on this very fragile ecosystem. And add to that the impacts that we've talked about already, climate change, deforestation, biodiversity loss, pollution. The result is the degradation of four million square kilometers of land every year. So that's, in perspective, that's half of Brazil every year. 120,000 square kilometers are turned into desert. That's that nice living soil turning into dead sand every year. And on the issue of plastics, Recent research shows the, the soil is absorbing more microplastic uh, than the ocean. We hear about, we've heard the disasters about plastic in the ocean. We don't hear so much about it in the soil, uh, but it's leaching into the soil and entering our, entering our food chain. And we need the help of all of you creatives in the agricultural sector too. Agriculture uses a lot of plastic, whether it's polytunnels to grow vegetables or plastic to make bales or cover soil for strawberry farms, etc. There's plastic everywhere, um, and, and we, need, we need your help. And it's time to really save, uh, save our soils. And that's what we can do right now. We know how to, we know how to do this. So I want to 
start with introducing you to a guy called Alan Savory. Um, you might not have heard of him, but he is uh, a pioneer in what's known as holistic uh, land management. And his take on the crisis that we're facing is that it's not an individual crisis that is the biggest challenge facing humanity. It's actually our own ability or inability to manage complexity. That's what's causing our problems. That's what's been driving linear thinking. Um, we design for single outcomes rather than embrace uh, complexity. We degrade our soil at the same time as our landfills are overflowing with uh, food waste, with organic matter that should be on the soil. So to save our souls, we need a, a, a circular thinking. We need regenerative, uh, a regenerative mindset that embraces this complexity. And I think the best way to kind of illustrate what a regenerative mindset is is through the principles of, of soil health, as you, as you see behind me. These help us in our work when we help work with farmers and, and companies to try and understand and see the potential for how agriculture can be a driver of positive outcomes, not just a, a reduction of, 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 bad, uh, of bad, in, uh, bad outcomes. So what are these principles? So let's start with uh, minimize disturbance. So what does this mean? This is moving to production systems that are no till or, 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 or minimum till. So tilling or plowing is, uh, releases carbon uh, into the atmosphere from the soil. It is, you can also imagine how devastating it is to the, to the, to the life in that upper area of the, of the soil, dragging, uh, dragging a rake through you know, vast areas of, of land. Is maximizing living roots. Ideally, you want plants to be growing in the soil year around. Those brown bare fields that you might see when driving through an agricultural area off season is, is the worst. We need to have, we need to have living, living roots in the soil. Plants that are alive feed the microbes. They hold the soil, they protect the soil from erosion. Then we have um, maximize soil cover. These are all pretty basic things, but they're incredibly important. So what does this mean? And never, never leave the land bare. Bare soils get starved of, of nutrients. They get starved of organic matter. They represent a harsh environment for that sensitive uh, life that is, in, that is in the soil. Bare soils get too hot in the summer, too cold in the winter, and is exposed to wind, water erosion, washes down the river and out to the ocean, and we'll never see it again. In your garden, this means leave the leaves. Don't pack them up and send them to landfill. And on a farm, it means leaving plant residue. It means growing taller grasses and seeing the, you know, doing everything we can to drive that circle. Finally, it's maximize biodiversity. So we must bring animals back on our land. And yes, we need more cows on our land, but also, uh, but also birds. By mimicking natural environments, that impact of having animal on the land and then giving land rest really kickstarts the biological functions in the soil. It feeds the life, it really, really drives life also improves the soil's capacity to sequester carbon. We must move away from monocropping. We need to plant different types of species of plants, often together, often with trees. Diversity above ground feeds biodiversity below ground, and together they create resilience. And if there's one thing we need to realize an incredible future, it's resilience in our food system. So building soil and building soil health is something we can do right now. Uh, it's not a recipe, but it's a circular mindset focused on maximizing the opportunity for life at every turn. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Christine. And just coming back to plastic in the soil, you're right. We're so emotionally connected to what we've done to the oceans. But the facts are, to up to 23 times as much plastic in our soil, where we grow the crops for future generations. So a quick question for you. Hands up, anybody who owns more than two pairs of sneakers. Come on, I know you do. <laughs> Okay, 26 billion pairs of sneakers are main, made every single year. So not only would the sneaker industry as a country be that 17th largest polluter, but the fact that nobody talks about this, it accounts for 1.4% of our greenhouse gas emissions. And to put that in perspective, look what air travel is, 2.5%. Everybody talks about planes and nobody talks about sneakers. So we're going to talk about sneakers. And so I'm very happy to welcome to the stage Dr. Luke Haverholz and Eric Ledke to talk about how we can reinvent this world of sneakers and beyond. Please come to the stage. So, Luke, let's start with you. And Ju Luke is not going to blow his own horn, so I just want to let everybody know. Luke, sitting here, Dr. Luke Haverholz, last year was awarded Inventor of the Year in the US. <laughs> and, uh, yes. And I'll, I want to put that in perspective. The year before, it was the inventor of the vaccine, and the year before that, it was the, the genome, what is it called? CRISPR. <laughs> CRISPR, the CRISPR genome technology. So if you can imagine that we go from those kind of extraordinary, world-changing technologies, particularly the vaccine, let's be honest, to a man who works in Illinois, working on how can we reinvent materials, I think you will realize the magnitude of what we're going to talk about today. So... <laughs> go Luke. Go Luke, yes. Um, so... Tell us a little bit of your story, Luke, and just how, what is the scalability of what you're doing? Explain the science behind it, and, and how this is not something that's just theory in a lab. What I've learned from you is you are out there. This is happening right now. You are our incredible future now. More new plants will grow today on Earth. Even though it's winter time in the northern hemisphere, we still have the southern hemisphere. We have the equator. More new plants grow in an, ever, in an average day on Earth than the tonnage of all the synthetic plastics produced by people in years. So when we take care of our soil, um, it takes care of us. And we, we know that intuitively um, when, we, when we eat a meal at home. I grew up in a place in the, in the Midwest um, and was sensitive to how abundant nature is if, if you take care of it. Uh, and then I grew up and I got a PhD in chemistry and I was a chemist interested in an economics problem. There was a quandary in my mind. Um, and it was, you know, people think plastics are cheap. In fact, they're the most expensive materials humans have ever created. People don't realize there's more than a hundred trillion dollars in landed global assets and, and, and on the water, by the way, too, to extract. We have this system that goes around the world extracting from the ground not putting things back in nice ways, by the way. Um, and then uh, most of that activity, economically speaking, in the last you know, 100 or so years has been towards making fuel. But a byproduct of that industry has been that we built the plastics industry basically for free on the, on the margins of producing fuel. Um, and so if you're gonna have a different system, then, then there's a very important economics issue in the technicalities of what you need to do. And that's that you have to find free infrastructure. Um, and I, I grew up in a place in Iowa where that infrastructure was all around me. It's, again, it's soil and plants. And it's abundant. And it's natural. Um, and what I also realized is the best chemist I know is my mom. Uh, 
what does she do? She takes nutrients and with an infrastructure, a, a common set of infrastructure, can convert those nutrients into a variety of things that are nutritious. And I thought, what if we could do that with materials? What if our shoes, what if our clothes, what if our furniture, what if our car interiors, what if our, the list goes on and on. What if we optimized recipes to take nutrients and do the one thing that plastics do really, really well, which is you can mold them and shape them into about anything. What if you could give the abundant nutrients that, that are out in the world, what if you could give them that superpower? Um, and, in, and then I'll say, I would still be in the chemistry lab, not here, were it not true that the, the answer is you can do this. Uh, natural fiber welding was founded um, with the knowledge that now we have ghost kitchens, not just in Peoria, Illinois, but now around the world. We're working with global partners and we're making it possible to make an ecosystem of materials for complex products like your shoes, like your clothes, and furniture, et cetera. If you don't, in other words, it's not good enough to make one new material to try to grow something from a mushroom. You need an ecosystem of materials in order to make complex things like shoes. And these shoes, I'm going to turn it over to Eric here, that these shoes are nutrients. At the end of their life, they can go back to soil. They came from soil, they can go back to soil. This is here today. It was built in global supply chain, and it's a model for all the sneakers on planet Earth. We do not need to make sneakers in this old model that's extractive and destroys the planet. We can make sneakers, we can make your clothes from nutrients. So our company is scaling that today. It's ready, you can buy it. The proof is on your feet right now. What I love from everything that I've learned, you know, talking to you over the last two years, and I have to say every time I have a conversation with Luke, I learn more and more stuff, he just blows my mind, because he, it's, it's a system. We're not talking about swapping one material for another. We're not talking about slightly less bad materials. We're talking about changing the entire system of how we take from nature and give back to nature. And that, for me, is just such a radical thought that could expand across anything. I mean, so at the moment, you're in the world of textiles, and we've seen some of the examples up here. But the, the scale, for me, of being able to look at buildings, second biggest user of plastic is the built environment. Obviously, fashion, massive packaging. But I, I can imagine that you could, in, in time, we could build cars out of materials that are fundamentally nutrient-based. We're already doing it, and they'll be coming out in the not-so-distant future. Yeah. So, it, well, what we do, we're scaling. Um, we don't, the folks that know about soil and, and how to regenerate and work with the planet, um, we don't, anyway, they're, they're doing that. What we do, we are the toolkit creators. We're creating the toolkit that can go to those 160 million creatives in the world and give you a different future of what, so Pangaea, like you see up on, this, on the screen here, right? We, we can make these products today from a completely different source. And so working with Eric um, has been an amazing journey and experience in, in building something complex. Yeah. Yeah, but, but it's, it's hard you work. Said that to me. Yeah, <laughs> but it's it's great work. Yeah, let's Eric. Let's turn to you. I mean, you are another legend in your in your world. My yeah, <laughs> um, and you've been obviously you've worked for some very big sportswear brands in the past. It'd be great. To tell us a little bit about why are you doing what you're doing now? Why did you found Unless? And how did this collaboration happen? Was it? Could it have been possible in any other way? There's a lot of questions there, but first and, first and foremost, um, hi everyone. I'm a 30 year fashion industry vet, 26 years at uh, Adidas, Adidas, uh, where I did everything basically from the mail room to the board floor. My last job was brand president, where I helped lead a turnaround at the company that was based on, um, you know, helping, uh, you know, creating, a, creating a better place for our consumers, both in their game their life, and most importantly, their world. Recognizing that our consumers were more than just athletes. They were, they were human beings, I think it was said earlier. They were people, and they weren't just our consumers. I'm sorry to use that word. I know that's a trigger word for the first presenter. <laughs> but these Bad. people, these, they consumed our product, can I say that? We focused in and we looked at them from 
all the angles that we all are. That they want to wear things to play better, jump higher, run faster. They also want to wear things that look good. But most importantly, they want to wear things that do less harm. Mm -hmm. So we started with um, this gentleman named Cyril Gooch at Parley for the Oceans, if you're familiar with. And we were the first brand in 2015 to launch uh, ocean plastic product. Um, then we went into recycled polyester, all things I'm very proud about. But in the back of my head, as I learned more about what the presenters and yourself presented so eloquently earlier, it became more and more difficult for me to sleep at night. Um, I was part of the make, take, and throw away culture, the, the fashion industry of planned obsolescence every three, six, nine months. And there's always so many songs you can sing yourself to as you lay your head on the pillow at night that makes that, you know, makes that happen. Um, it, it makes you not, not think about that and fixate it all the time. So I recognize I have children. They're going to have children. They're going to have children. So I started to think what happens in 100 years from now if I don't leave what I'm doing and, and try something new. So I left with a clear intention. Everyone in the industry knows if we can make things from less harmful stuff, it'll do less harm to the industry, less harm to the planet. It's just a question of getting there um, and finding partners with the chemistry innovations that Luke, has, that, that Luke has created in his team, but also has the unit economics to establish that at scale. Mm -hmm. I think those things are important. I think anybody can make lot size one. It's important to really drive that home and be able to be a clear disruptor. So when Luke and I, I what Luke and we are trying to do, the NFW and Unless team, is really create a Tesla-like moment for the fashion industry and create a better way. If you remember when Tesla came along, your options for electric vehicles were very limited. Um, even though everybody knew electric vehicles were the answer, nobody was bold enough to go out there until an outside-in um, brand came at it. And so with Unless, we're trying to be that outside-in brand. And um, super excited about it, super challenging. Every, every, uh, every, every brief is a long, dark hallway we have to walk down. We embrace that. We love being pioneers. We love being innovators. But it isn't easy as a startup. But we're thrilled to be here today talking to like-minded people. And I love what you've also done with the degenerate is, uh, you know, a lot of people think that sustainable fashion has to be a little bit knitted on pit hairy sandal. <laughs> and, you know, look what you've done. I mean, you're, you've, you're elevating everything. And that's what we have to do as creatives. Consumer, we have to the, elevate the people the right cannot thing. compromise their taste for their values. Yes. Why would we ask them to, to, to compromise one thing for the other? And that's right now they're being faced with that. Yeah. And, and every day they're faced with, well, you can have this or look like this or you can, you can speak to your you know, tastes and know that you're not helping things. So why don't we give them the same thing? And, you know, and so we wanted to pilot the first ever lighthouse brand that's 100% that's made from plants and minerals that harmlessly goes away at the end of life. And that is the Unless Collective. I ask you all to join. Yeah. <laughs> how, how easy do you think it would be for those monolithic Adidas, Nike, you know, the big fashion brands, the Zaras of the world, to follow in your footsteps? Or do you think that their, their industries are so fundamentally built around plastic, it's almost impossible? Well, that's the dream, right? I mean, we're either smart enough, confident enough, foolish enough, or arrogant enough to think that we can change it. And I think we wouldn't do this if we were just trying to create generational wealth for ourselves. Mm -hmm. We're trying to create generational change. And that means doing it at scale and doing it with the urgency that the world needs. I, I'm, we're very focused on disrupting the entire industry by partnering with the industry. It's not a us versus them, it's an us. I'm a big believer in it's gonna take a village, it's gonna be led by the creatives, but it's gonna take a village to come along. And so what I can apply with my team is the operational know-how of having worked for a big brand for 26 years to know how to really bring that change inside them and do it in a in a way that's that's um, uh, that's collaborative with them and and the and the benchmarks they have set out the fiduciary responsibility they have the com the current supply chains they have as Luke said he's spreading into those same areas in in Asia and Europe uh, to really make sure that we're not having to create something brand new we're plugging into existing things that's how you create change overnight you don't do it by you know, wagging your finger and, 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 and making people feel bad that they, um, that they aren't doing it your way, which is the perfect way. And I don't believe in perfect. I believe in, you know, yeah. don't, not letting perfect get in the way better. Yeah, guilt, guilt is a finger pointing. It's not the way. But we, we rest on that a lot. You back people into a corner, they will fight their way out. Exactly. In including the fossil fuel industry. Let's just make them redundant by doing stuff like this that makes everybody just want to get there. If you give people a choice, they'll vote with their wallets. The electric vehicle industries, for example, well, I think we just crested 5% of, 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 of all car sales in America. That is a tipping point to 20%. Yeah. And the same thing can happen here. It can happen that fast. And think about plant-based milks. 
Sorry, I keep going on, but there's plenty of use cases out there. Yeah. Back in when we were younger, um, you had to choke down almond milk. Now it's like, who doesn't prefer oatly? I mean, it's crazy talk. I mean, I, I, oat milk is the standard. It's like, ooh, oat milk, ooh, yeah. Like, it's not like you're the weird vegan in the corner, you know, t you know scratching down some almond milk. Yeah. Sorry for the almond people in the room. <laughs> so, Luke, is there anything that you want to leave this creative audience with? Um, impact and scale are synonyms. They're two sides of the same coin. There's, there's, there's a lot of people that get a lot of press in media these days that they've taken a picture of something that you can't touch. They've done a, a life cycle analysis on a material you can't buy, you can't enjoy, and it's meaningless. Mm -hmm. It's utterly meaningless. Everybody in this room gets to have opinions. Not everybody in this room has a technically competent opinion. <laughs> He's told me that for three years. Okay. <laughs> and, and I'll say, uh, if, if you can't answer fundamental questions about how to get your materials to the scale of not just millions, but billions, if you can't answer that question, then your idea is not good enough. Now, that's not to say that we can't have niche applications. That's not my point. My point is to make generational change. People have lots and lots of people. The, the majority of this room has to be able to consume different products from different places. Okay, it turns out that, that uh, awards aside, really natural fiber welding is the receiver of that award. There's a, there's a huge team um, that's part of this. It's not just me. Um, but it turns out we didn't have to invent the most important piece which is that there is already life in the soil that sequesters carbon dioxide using solar energy. And it's at such an enormous scale, you, as long as humans take care of the soil, we cannot possibly exhaust it. It's that Fu similar. Fundamentally, this is a product and there's many more. You know, we're working with the Ralph Lorenz and the Pangaeas and the Reformations and the uh, uh, unless, unless, unless collective. collectives and the <laughs> Allbirds and the campers and, I can, and the BMWs and I can go on and on and on. The, some of the biggest brands in the world I can't talk about publicly right now because what they want to do with us is so profound they don't want their competitors sometimes to know. But fundamentally, <laughs> as long as the, the right investors in the crowd understand it, we'll, you'll learn soon enough. Yeah. Um, fundamentally, Making materials, and not just one, ecosystems to do complex things like shoes, like furniture. Making those materials in completely non-toxic ways. In, in ways that fundamentally you care about the cotton farmers that don't till the soil in the ways that they would conventionally do it, but they, they allow that cover crop to stay there. And being able to pay them more money, by the way, that's, that's what we're able to do. Connect those regenerative stewards with the product you buy. Yeah. That's a fundamental mind, it's not just a technical shift, it's a mindset shift that goes from industries that fundamentally are extractive and always will be because of the nature of what they do to something that is fundamentally powered by the sun, regenerative, and, and by the way, is hand in hand and lockstep with how we need to eat. Yeah. Why would we do anything different? Okay. The, We'll answer Natural that fiber welding, <laughs> the, the answer Eric, is here. Eric, is there anything that you wanted to quickly leave the audience with? No, uh, I, other I, than I, buy and less collective. I, 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 I said my piece, but I, I do think it's, it's responsible for all of us to vote with our wallets at the end of the day. We're, we're startups. Yeah. I mean, it's like we're, we're, we're always undercapitalized. You know, that's just the world of startups versus leaving the big ships. But I think it's, it's exciting. And I think if you care enough, you know, then we need to, we need to, Plug, we need to put our hands in a pile and, and show the industry that there is a better way. That helps Luke scale. That helps me work on collaborations and partnerships and brings the urgency to the, to the, to the issues we, we have to solve. I totally agree. We have that, that level of personal responsibility. Much as I don't think it should be our problem, it's a business problem, yep. we have a level of personal yeah, responsibility. And, and you vote with your wallet every single day. And the sneaker industry is shockingly large and, and a big contributor. Yeah. If you care about what you eat and if you care about what you drive, you should damn well care about what you wear. Yeah. So, here we are. Touche. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So, we're going to move now um, to...
to talking about some of the some of the, the plastic that we feel really guilty about. I don't know if anybody feels guilty when they go and they do their supermarket shop and they come home and they free their food from these tombs of plastic and they realize they've filled an entire recycling bin just with stuff that has been useful for moments and will exist on the planet for centuries. So I now want to welcome two people to the stage who are not light on opinion, uh, who are going to talk to us a little bit about how we can use the design industries particularly to help drag everybody into this incredible future now. So please, welcome to the stage, Andrew Gibbs and Brian Collins. Thank you, Sean. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you guys so much for being here today. I just want to take a moment to really express my gratitude. Um, as one of the co-founders of Plastic Free, it means the absolute world to me to have your support and, and our entire team, it means the world. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. Um, I'm so excited to be joined uh, with uh, joined here today for a conversation with Brian Collins. Uh, Brian's the co-founder and chief creative officer of Collins, an independent strategy and brand experience design company based here in New York. Um, but quickly before I start, I want to give you a little bit of background information, a little context. At Dyeline, my, my team and I strive to celebrate beautiful package design um, and, and to celebrate the industry as a whole. And almost about five years ago now, uh, after literal brain surgery, I, I had an epiphany. Um, you know, they say sometimes when you have brain surgery, it does that. It's actually true. Um, I realized that dye line was a big part of the problem, as so much of what we feature is plastic. So since then, our site has undergone a sea change in terms of content, uh, many thanks to Bill McCool, my amazing editor here. Um, covering plastic-free stories and sustainable materials has really become a cornerstone of our editorial content. But our industry was still missing something. I heard from so many designers and brands and agencies who all expressed a need for a centralized resource to source plastic-free materials and system change innovations. So I partnered with the incredible A Plastic Planet team, um, along with Made Thought, to make this resource a reality. Um, I want to give a massive thank you to Ben Parker, who is here in the audience today. Ben Parker. Um, as well as his entire team at Made Thought for the incredible, beautiful design of our branding, our entire platform. Uh, ben has been our creative partner since the launch of A Plastic Planet. And we're just so grateful for, his ben, for, for ben and his team for bringing our vision to life. We, we literally could not be here today without you. So thank you, Ben, and thank you to Made Thought. Today, sustainability is the future of our industry. And that's why Plastic Free is so important. And that's why Brian and I are both here today uh, and so excited to be here to have this conversation. So without further ado, Brian, I want to start by um, asking you something about something you said right up here. Yep. Um, nature is the best, most intelligent designer there is. Yeah. But we have overwhelmed it to the point where, we where it cannot recover. Yeah. So it's time to start designing apart from nature and start designing as a part of nature, yeah. which we are. Can you talk about that? What does it mean to design as a part of nature? Well, let me ask you a question. I don't know if the AV people are up there. Could we bring the house lights up just a teeny bit? I have a question I want to ask everybody. Is that possible? If it's not, I'm okay. There you go. That's perfect. How many people here work at an advertising agency? Yeah. Okay. Do you ever hear the word consumer-centric? Yeah. Yeah. Love that word. How many people work at a design firm? Oh, yeah. How many people have heard the word that has been banged into our heads for 30 years called human-centered design? <laughs> the two of the most ridiculous concepts that we need to eradicate, because those two concepts put us at odds with nature. Human-centered design, as if the human being is the most important thing that we can address. The convenience of a plastic bottle is remarkable. It solves one problem, it solves for X without realizing it's any of its consequences. And designers are particularly adept, as are creative people at advertising agencies, to hide the consequences of what happens to a plastic bottle. So great, I'm thirsty, I'm running, I grab a plastic bottle, I drink it, and it goes in the trash. As a result, what's happening is there will literally be more plastic in our oceans than there are fish. Because what we're doing is we're designing in a human-centric way. We have to stop both of these terms, 
consumer-centric and human-centric, we have to start thinking about planet-centric, nature-centric. We can no longer design for X, I want the convenience of a water bottle, I have to, we have to design for X, Y, and Z. What happens to that water bottle? Where does it go? How is it reused? Why should we be using that water bottle in the first place? Or that plastic bottle, pardon me. So that's what I think we, means we have, to, we have to, not only do we have to change the way be, we behave, we also, we're entering a new world. And you can't enter a new world unless you have the language for it, which means we need to leave the language of the 20th century behind. Human-centric design and consumer-centric marketing. Got to get rid of it. That's what I think. I mean, that means we just have to kind of, we have to enter the 21st century with, with new language and new words. We can't, we can't take effectively marketing language, which in America, in the United States, and in most of the Western parts of the world, was defined by the go-go years after World War II when everything was exploding. We're no longer in that world anymore, so we need new language. And human-centered human -centered thinking in design and consumer-centric uh, marketing um, will not get us there. That makes sense. Um, when did you start uh, changing how you really thought about this? Um, obviously, we're designers, and there are a lot of designers in the room. Yeah. Um, and we've probably all designed a lot of things in plastic, and I, I am guilty as uh, among probably yep. you and, and half of everyone in here. Yep. Um, when did you begin to feel a sense of responsibility toward this? And how did it change your approach to design and systems evolving beyond the status quo? I um, grew up with a writer named Bill McKibben, who wrote an incredible book in 1989 uh, called The End of Nature. Bill basically, our, all the things that we're now going through, Bill basically outlined in his book called The End of Nature. It's been translated into like 100 languages around the world. If you don't know the book, you should read it. Bill set the alarm off then. And he was looking at data from NASA scientists that said that what we're, we're burning off the atmosphere, we're putting so much carbon in the atmosphere, we're basically, we basically turn um, our atmosphere into a giant sewer system. We keep on pumping heat and garbage and carbon into it. So it's, it's, it's going to kill nature. Um, so that was 1989 when I, um, Bill started to write these articles in the New Yorker, and then he turned it into a book. So 1989 was really the, the turning point. Then in 1995, the AIGA asked me to, if I would put some kind of a book together um, that uh, would help designers understand the urgency of environmental thinking. Um, and not only would we help frame an environmental approach to, to, to design, but also help designers create offices that had um, more responsible methodologies in creating work. Now, this is before technology. This is when we were still, people were still ordering typography. So this was 1995, in fact. I have a copy of the book here. And what I realized is that in order to get people excited about things, you just couldn't hit them over the head with depressing data. So I invited Paul Rand. I invited a bunch of really amazing designers to, to, to work with me on this book. And, um, and it, it went to every designer in the AIJ in 1995. Here is, here is your, I brought a copy for you. And that's your copy. And we, now we published that in 1995. Now imagine now, all this time later, this is basic. This is the resource the designers had in 19. It was published in 1996. By the way, would, would anyone like this? Anybody? There you go. You were the first. You there? Yeah. There you go. Can you pass this to her, for me? Thank you. That was the resource we had. <laughs> we designed it. We got a writer to, to put it, it together. That was basically it. And what you could find. Um, this is you know really before the web. Now, with these conferences and all this information, all the things that we can do now are incredible. Everyone in this room is a wizard. Everyone in the room has incredible powers to help shape this conversation. I don't mean that metaphorically. One of the things that we really, really need to do as a community of people recognize that we're in the business of creating desire. And you have a choice. And I hear about this all the time. You know, are we talking about, people are talking about the future and the future and the future and the future. There's no such thing as the future. The future isn't outside. It doesn't arrive tomorrow. It's not coming next week. There's no such thing as the future. The only thing that exists are the futures. And there are thousands of futures that are all in competition with each other. But primarily, there are two futures. One, which we recognize the Earth is a limited, uh, has a limited capacity to deal with human impact or we just ignore it and we continue to behave as if it's 1955. Those are the two futures that are in play. You can either advance the one that's going to be regenerative and healthy for everyone, or you're going to advance the other one. 
We're in the business of creating desire, creating usability, creating usefulness. We have enormous influence. And we have to choose which of these futures are we going to invest in. There's no such thing as the future. We have to choose where we're going to put our time, our energy, and our talents. Thank you. Um, in a piece last year on Dialine, you mentioned that as an industry, that we are long past the point of plausible deniability. Yep. Nor is there any time left for corporate greenwashing or green wishing, and that good intentions no longer cut it. Yep. Can you expand on that as far as where our industry stands, how brands are adapting, and how long do you think it will take to see actual meaningful, significant change? Our company was launched with uh, Al Gore hired us to do a campaign for the Alliance for Climate Protection. And that's, kind of, that's how we began. What Al Gore was talking about in Assault on Reason, dramatic weather change, droughts, all the things he was talking about, he's been talking about for years, were finally, it's, you know, the, 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 the future he was concerned about has shown up at our, at, our front, at our front door. So there's no turning back. What that means in my mind is, you know, I, I keep on hearing this, and you guys hear this. Have you heard about the net zero world? Yeah? How many people here are in their early 20s? How many, people are, how many, how many of you are in your 20s? Oh, great. Uh -huh. We don't want you to do anything. Make it zero. <laughs> Boy, is that inspiring? Net zero. No, we need to be net positive. We can no longer design out the bad. We have to design in the good. So for the next generation, it's not enough to just be, you know, to, to take care of the things that have been horrible. We now have to find systems that uh, accelerate regeneration and create and improve what we've done to the planet over the last 50 years. So it is no longer, if you're in net zero, completely respond instantly with net positive. Why can't things be net positive? Why can't we put things in the world that make it better, not neutral? And the other word that we need to get rid of, how many of you heard the word sustainability? <laughs> how many people have a girlfriend or a boyfriend in this room? If you were to describe your relationship, how would you say, my relationship with my boyfriend, it's sustainable. <laughs> how many people go to conferences and go, ooh, we're gonna go to the sustainability conference, like, or the sustainability um, meeting? Uh, really, sustainability? Let's, it, one, first of all, there's nothing sustainable about the way we're living, and two, it's a ridiculous concept. Regeneration, making things better, not net zero, net positive, is how we need to be framing this. We're past the point of net zero. We've got to be at the point of um, net positive. Um, speaking of systems, how can designers actually change the systems that we currently have in place? Um, I think we have to recognize that we sit at tables of enormous influence. Has anyone in this room ever drank Fiji water? Can someone tell me why you drink Fiji water? Anyone? Why? Yes. Is what? It was in the hotel. You have no water faucets in your hotel? Now, Fiji water, if you look at any, and the Vox did a thing on this, Fiji water takes 2,000 amounts, 2,000 times the amount of energy to, to get into your hotel room than it does for you to get a cup and drink it out of the faucet. Fiji water is made up. It creates this mythology of a beautiful Polynesian island, and somehow you'll be transported to a world outside of whatever grim hotel room you might have been in. <laughs> I'm drinking Fiji water. Imagine Fiji. Imagine trucks and trains dragging water out of wells in Fiji, down a mountainside, into trains, onto a plane, which, by the way, can only be half filled because it has to go across the Pacific in order to get to Los Angeles, where it's unloaded into trucks and onto trains and then onto smaller cars and into small little vans into the Gristides or the Stop and Shop or Safeway, wherever it is you're buying it, as opposed to just going over to the faucet. We're in the business. We create desire. If you work in advertising and you work in, 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 in design, in addition, if you work in design, you're also creating utility and usefulness. I understand that. But we also create desire. Let's stop creating desire for things as silly as Fiji water and create desires for things that 
are more responsible and more regenerative and healthier for the planet, not just for someone who wants to think that they're having dreams, of, you know, a Polynesian fever dream as they drink water. And on that note. And on that happy note. <laughs> so, thank you. you, know, thank you. I want to close on one thought Please. here because I was, at the first presentation, I was getting a little sad because it seemed so overwhelming. And someone, had, you ever heard this expression, hope is not a strategy? It is. I'm going to read this one quote, and then I'm going to close this out. I don't know why hope is really important for us. Our definition of design is, design is hope made visible. And you guys can do this. Listen to this. Hope is not a lottery ticket. You can sit on the sofa and clutch feeling lucky. Hope is an ax. Hope is an ax that you can break down doors with in an emergency. Hope. Hope should shove you out the door because it will take everything you have to steer the future away from the annihilation of the Earth's treasures and the grinding down of the poor on the marginal. To hope. To hope. To hope is to give yourself the, ch the future. Oh, sorry, to give yourself to the future. Hope is to give yourself to the future, and in that commitment to the future is what makes the present inhabitable. Hope is a strategy. Thank you so much, Brian. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian, for all those wise words. Thank you, thank you. Amazing, Andrew. Um, okay, we're gonna rattle on now at pace because I know some of you have got places to go and things to do, but I just wanted to mention that all of these speakers are gonna be here on the stage at the end for you to come and have a chat with. So hang around. We are not going to be thrown out in any way. So if you want to meet any of these speakers and have a chat with them about an issue, a problem, anything that you want, then just hang here. Um, we're going to move on now to another incredible collaboration in that area that we all feel so guilty about, the area of packaging. And we're going to have a quick little video of 10 minutes talking to these extraordinary people of Shellworks and Haeckel's and when they came together in order to create some really magical solutions. So these two people, Charlie and Insia from Haeckel's and uh, Shellworks, have created a whole new genre of packaging, which again is available now at scale and at speed. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Patrick Keogh from Plastic Free, and I'm delighted to be in conversation this afternoon with two incredible entrepreneurs. Um, I don't know about others in the room, but I think entrepreneurs are truly amazing. They have pluck, resolve, imagination, ingenuity, and this complete drive for reinvention, which I think we all know is what society and the planet needs, needs right now. We only have about 10 minutes together, um, so I'd love to kick off with some very, very quick introductions. I wondered if you could start um, by telling us who you are and give us a very, very quick introduction to what your company does and why you're so passionate to be creating new solutions and being in this new solution space. And Incia, maybe I could come to you first. Amazing, uh, lovely to be here, Patrick. Um, yeah, so I'm Incia, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Shellworks. I guess Shellworks has always been on a mission to make plastic waste a thing of the past, um, but I think it is also really just a blend of, I don't know, a love for natural materials, the natural world, research, development, design, engineering, but then combining those like passions that we have as people into making a very tangible, scalable impact. Amazing, thank you very much. And Charlie, if I could just come to you now as well, tell us a little bit about- Yes, hi everyone. Uh, hey. And thank you for having me. Um, I'm Charlie, I'm the Managing Director of Heckles. Um, our official tagline is we act as amplifiers of the natural world. Um, it's what that means is there's no sort of problem that's too small or too big for us to tackle. Um, so we concentrate on home care, we concentrate on skincare, um, and we are um, a sort of green manufacturer in Margate. Um, so we harvest our ingredients down there um, and turn them into amazing game-changing products. Incredible. Um, I'm sure everyone in the room would agree we've got two incredible people with us. Um, Given we've only got a very short time together, there's three things that I'm really, really interested in getting into. The first one is um, around materiality that really matters, which I know that you're both incredibly passionate about. The second one, which is, is the perennial question from any designer is about, you know, how scalable is this? and How much does it cost? Because um, that's always a big pushback. Um, and the third thing that I'd love to get into if we've got time is around collaboration. So perhaps, Charlie, if we start with you, um, Heckles is 
pretty much on every deck um, or every mood board um, of every creative agency we encounter at Plastic Free. Um, and as a consumer, there's no doubt that branded trash, you know, the everyday packaging we consume is the thing that we all feel probably most guilty about. What was the process and conscious thinking behind building a brand at Heckles where the materiality, not only of your products, i.e. what went into it, but also the packaging takes center stage. Just tell us a little bit about that journey. Yeah, of course. Um, that's lovely to hear. Um, it's been baked into the DNA of the brand from day one. It's always about how can we turn waste into gold? So it started with seaweed in Margate, harvesting that off the coastline in Kent. So that was where every idea has come from, is turning a waste ingredient into a, a solution. As we've scaled and as we've grown, we've always sort of looked at new materials to bring to market that's always um, contrasted against, will customers want this? Because for all the best intent in the world, if your customers aren't looking to, to, to have a solution thrust into them, um, it's not worth doing. And so I think there's a very key, uh, clear, deliberate process of customer conversation that is embedded into every decision that um, Heckles as a brand makes. Um, our customers will call us out. Our customers will call us, they'll email us, they'll DM <laughs> us. And I think it's a really open, honest dialogue and that allows us to, to, to problem solve together. Um, and so the reason that we sort of partnered up is it, it was on conversations with our customers. And as um, the world sort of closed down, we were looking at our um, in-store recycling rates and they dropped down. And so we really wanted to focus on how can we work together to create a solution um, to the waste problem. And so you can still have those sort of pioneering ingredients, those star ingredients inside the packaging um, of, what, um, of which we're all known for. And then ultimately it can be a, a, a decision that we make for the customer as the end of, end of life cycle analysis. Okay, amazing. So almost like taking the guilt away a little bit from the customer. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Which we, by the way, are fully like bought into. I have to say, like industries, as as you've probably heard from Sean already today, industry is the biggest single tool of change that's out there. Really, like, why are consumers the ones who are having to take the brunt and make the decisions? Let's just make the decisions easier for them. I love that. Um, Incia, can we come to you now? Um, obviously at Shellworks, uh, you, you've managed to kind of, you've become the creator really pioneering this new type of nature-based packaging, which also, by the way, looks completely sick. Um, why, <laughs> why, why is what you're doing so revolutionary beyond stating, I guess, the obvious? And how did you get to a set of solutions with your materials that walk that really kind of like delicate line between performance cost and scalability which is always on the lips of like every designer that we speak to yeah i think it's an it's an interesting one because it's i feel like a lot of what is in shellworks dna and how we built it was always trying to think about a particular constraint a little bit differently um so while the packaging was was re revolutionary i don't think we really think about it like that it's like these solutions have always existed but they haven't been able to get into the right hands or the right minds thinking about it. So a lot of why I think we've been able to do what we have is that we have both designers, scientists and engineers thinking about the same problem in three different ways. And some problems are much easier to solve if you're an engineer, but some problems are much easier if you solve as a scientist or maybe as a designer, you could change the shape of the packaging and then it becomes much easier to manufacture and vice versa. And I think that's kind of what's made it actually tangible and available in the market is being able to kind of troubleshoot using three different disciplines rather than one. Um, I think, yeah, I think it is really about making it easy and taking the onus away from the customer, uh, kind of like what Charlie was mentioning and kind of trying to eliminate the waste. Because I think what we've always felt is plastic is a wonderful material, but it's misused. It's misused in so many different environments and it's kind of our responsibility to create something that lasts only as long as it needs to. Absolutely. We couldn't agree with you more. It should be, as Charlie said, like gold, not like, you know, <laughs> not like the square root of nothing, you know. Um, interestingly, just on that point of scalability, I don't want to probe too much on it. Like how scalable is, is this material? How much of it have you got? So designers <laughs> watching in the room, like how do they how do they get their hands on it? Um, and how can we how can people help you create more of it quicker? Yeah, I mean, it's a great point. Uh, it's. It is scalable, but I would say that it's tough, which is why we are sp sticking to very specific applications and 
to be honest, as much as we want to open it up, we want to also really bring focus into exactly what we're doing and trying to troubleshoot like one application, which is why we started in skincare and why the collaboration with Heckles was so perfectly timed. But, you know, we did 100,000 units. That's not meaningless with Heckles. And now we're on our way to try and scale our operations up to a million units. And we want to go to like 5 million units the year after. So it's a stage way approach, but we have confidence we're going to get there. Okay, fantastic. And uh, anyone in this room can help you investors? Do you need more money? Is there a figure? <laughs> Either I think you... I just, I would honestly love to, I mean, one, hear how people are thinking about the plastics problem. I think uh, everyone contextualizes and communicates in, in different ways. And I'm always interested to hear about that. Okay, amazing. So um, I know that we, we're running out of time already, which I can't believe because we're only just into this conversation. But um, last month, Sean and I were at uh, the World Economic Forum in Davos, um, launching Plastic Free. Um, and the watchword of the, this year's particular forum was around collaboration and how like-minded and talented businesses, organizations, and people across the spectrum can come together to create genuine impact. We also know how difficult that is from our conversations with people like Joss at Reckitt, um, you know, those organizations and traditional FMCG and CPG companies are traditionally very siloed um, or have been when it comes to speaking to each other, let alone collaborating or sharing information to drive a higher purpose agenda. Um, you know, the focus, I guess, is, is still on selling more stuff. How did you two find each other and what does collaboration mean for both of you? And Charlie, maybe I could throw back to you on that. Yeah, sure. Um, so we'd been um, aware of Shellworks for a number of years, um, predominantly from their prior material. Um, and it was actually a happy coincidence that we share a similar, the same investor. Um, so our investor actually introduced us and uh, and it was sort of at the stage of the Vivima material um, being ready to, to bring to market. Um, so the stars sort of aligned for us from that perspective. And I think yeah. for us, we never really see anything as a collaboration we always like to see it as a, a co-solve so how can you leverage each other's expertise to create something that's bigger than the individual parts and so it was just one of those natural collaborations of where we got in a room and the magic happened yeah and I mean I think behind the scenes we've always been massive admirers of Heckles so we'd like followed the brand right throughout we'd always been like oh they make like really great innovations and like push themselves a lot so it just felt really serendipitous when like Charlie came down to the office, he saw our whole process. It felt like we were like speaking the same language and yeah, we, I, I don't know, just it felt like our morals and values as brands really aligned. Amazing, love that. Co-solve and value alignment, key to collaboration. Um, I think we're out of time, um, but a massive thank you from all of us, me in particular, and the Plastic Free team for contributing to today's event. Um, Find out more about Shellworks and Heckles online if you don't know about them already. And uh, Incia and Charlie, thank you so much for um, being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. All right. We're starting to accelerate into some interesting stuff now. Um, we're going to end with a, a, a panel, and I mention again that everybody is going to be here if, if you want to have a chat with anybody. But we're now um, going to refer to another legend, the legend that is Sir David Attenborough. And trust me, when he goes, it's going to be bigger than the Queen for us in the UK. I think that this is going to be beyond a state funeral. This is going to be a global funeral of, of something. But I love this quote from him, we have all the solutions. So saving our planet now, it's a communications challenge. And what we're all in the business of is, you know, I always say, we don't, uh, I used to be in the business of selling stuff. I ran a skincare brand. I'm a massive part of the problem, a big plastic sinner. I don't sell stuff anymore. I sell change. And it's a mindset that if we can start to communicate change in that way of marketing it, using our communications, our design skills, our marketing skills. These shouldn't be bad, dirty words anymore, but now we can sell change. But I'm going to turn to somebody who is a third of the age of David Attenborough and hear what the role of the future creative can really be. So welcome to the stage, Tom and Massad. Am I on? I'm on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Guys, how is everybody doing? We're almost there. We're almost there. Um, I've got to start actually 
not on this slide, because you'll notice there's only one of me. And so I have to start with this man, who sadly couldn't actually be with us here today. But he is without a doubt the reason I am stood here today. So I need to start with him. This is Masad. He is my co-founder. He is creative director of our agency. And he is one of the most visionary people I've ever met in my life because of what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, unfortunately, he's in the hospital having his appendix removed as we speak. So uh, let's everyone just wish him his, uh, his best. Send all of our thoughts while I'm talking nonsense in front of you. But just know that all of this it's really the brainchild of him, and it's coming out of him. So any bad stuff, we can blame me, but any good stuff, think of it as coming out of this guy here. But guys, I'm going to go back to the obviously shocking comment on the first slide. I think if there's one super clear takeaway that you can have so far from everyone who has spoken, it's that we are all responsible for, if nothing else, creating a better future than what is currently ahead of us. Because as somebody else said earlier, there is not this one version of future that we're moving towards. We will move to the version of the future that we all collectively want to create. And that will only happen when we start to challenge the way that things are done now, which is a little bit difficult. And right now, it is scientifically proven that five-year-olds are actually better at doing that than any of us. It's the only job we need to do, and they're going to be a lot better at it. But hold on, now I can flick. Specifically, as Sean kind of introduced me, uh, we run a creative agency that does a lot of marketing content. But really, everything I'm going to say is relevant to anybody because we are in total agreement that entrepreneurs are probably more creative than anybody sat in any creative agency in creative industries generally, whatever those might actually mean. And in a, long, a lot of ways, it's because currently in our industry, and we see it, we suffer, we do it ourselves sometimes, we do mediocre safe thinking. We fail to challenge clients at the right moments. We take part in things like greenwashing, which obviously is one of the things we're all here to stop. And there's a big why, really. And it really boils down to quite a simple thing for us. It's a very, very simple solution that enables us to unlock better creativity, allows us to challenge people, and allows us fundamentally to be all part of creating the future that we need to be part of. Because again, we do not have a choice at this stage. So. If it's going to flick. Before I tell you this simple solution, I'd like everyone to feel it. So if everyone wants to just close their eyes for two minutes, and I'm going to make you do it, I will be looking if anyone keeps them open. Everyone close your eyes and just take yourself back to school. Or for some people, you're still in school. But take yourself back. You're sitting in your dorm room. It's three days before this huge essay is due. You've meant to have done it two weeks ago. But luckily, you've got a great plan. So you sit down to do it, and you whip out the plan that you made a week ago, where you color coordinated all the stages of your plan with different highlighters to get you ready to write the essay. You then underlined it in different types of underline, again, at each stage, ready to write it. But now's the time to do it. You sit down. You're ready to put pen to paper. And then out of nowhere, you hear a bottle of wine open next door. And you have that little split second moment, that decision that we all face on a daily basis, whether we tell ourselves we do or not, where you're like, should I do one thing or should I do the other? Should I sit here and finish this essay I know I need to do or do I go next door? And somehow in that moment, we convince ourselves that it's okay. Like, actually, if I spend two days doing that essay instead of three, I'll be more efficient with my time. So it's a net benefit that really I should actually go and drink some wine right now, really. So... What is that feeling? That feeling when you tell yourself that actually you should go drink the wine, and that feeling when you first sat down to write the essay and instead you made a color chart of different plans and lines and things like that. What is that feeling? Because it's a super, super simple thing that affects us on such, such a big way. And that answer is honesty. But again, as a lot of people have made clear today, we do not have time for half measures. So today we're going to talk about radical honesty. And now, before everyone goes around starting to offend people under the guise of being radically honest now, we need to understand what we actually mean and why we do it. And it's super, super interesting because this, it sounds simple, it sounds soft, but in fact, it's incredibly hard, and it is the key to unlocking the creatives that all of us sat here actually are. Growing up, it's very, very interesting. We all start when we're kids. We, we, we play pretend, cowboys and Indians, for me, it was Cher or Elwood's, but whatever it was for you is fine. We start pretending, and then suddenly this weird thing happens when we get to around 17 or 18, where we start pretending that we're not pretending. We start to tell these porcupines, these lies about ourselves, to ourselves and to the people around us, 
so that we can start to build this version of ourselves that protects us from what's actually happening out there. We start to build a picture of the world that isn't actually the world, but again, is the version of the world that makes it slightly easier to digest, to maintain the person that we want to be, maybe versus the person that we actually are. We tell ourselves that we're happy when we're not. We tell ourselves that we have all the answers. We try to make people think that we have all the answers because that's who we want to be when we actually don't. And often we try to make people think that we're mediocre because we don't want to be arrogant when actually, look around this room, I think there are very, very few mediocre people here. And now, all of that perpetuates this cycle of creating this version of ourselves that isn't actually accurate. And it creates this version of the world that we don't actually sit in. And while all of this sounds a little bit random, what I'm saying, and a little bit disconnected, it actually has some pretty radical side effects. Two seconds. So NASA did this super, super interesting study ages ago, back in the 60s, where they took a classroom of five-year-olds and they tried to investigate creativity in children. And they saw that when they, when they tested a group of five-year-olds, 90% of the class were deemed creative in NASA's eyes. Not probably the best metric, but that meant to them that they were able to suggest innovative new ideas and solutions to problems they were, they were given. Now, when that same group of children were tested again when they were 18, that, no that number of 90% dropped to 5%. So what has happened between 5 and 18 that means suddenly we cannot be creative and we cannot come up with anything? It's that we start to pretend that we're not pretending. We become increasingly dishonest with ourselves, with everybody around us, and we discover that this method of protecting ourselves from the world of around us kind of works for us, but we realize it's not actually working deep, deep down. We've all sat, just to bring us to like a slightly more real thing we've all sat here and done, everyone who put their hand up saying they're in an advertising agency, we have all sat in a meeting where someone is giving us a strategy and they're giving us a million intelligent ways why it's the best answer and we're all sat there with this feeling that we think something's not right. We think they're telling us a tall tale. We think it's not true, but we don't challenge it. We buy into it and so does everyone in this room because we all want to still feel that feeling like we're part of this great agency doing great work. And we don't want to face the reality that actually maybe we're not doing the right stuff. Maybe we're not creating the right solutions. And in those situations where we do it, like, like for instance, for me, I've sat in countless meetings where people are showing us data about campaigns we've made. And I just, I know deep down that that data has not been analyzed in the right way, but I don't want to question it because then I'm destroying the reality that I've created for myself that, you know, we're a great agency doing only great work. But actually, if we're honest with ourselves, does the idea that was being talked about, does the campaign that we created actually become great because we're not honest with ourselves? No. Does anyone actually achieve genuine deep down satisfaction? No. And more importantly, have we been part of creating any different future? No. We've just perpetuated the systems that got us in that room in the first place. We've pushed the same pieces around the board and we've sustained this version of the world that we've so carefully built for ourselves, all at the cost of genuine progress, and it's not an exaggeration to say greatness for everybody involved. Massad, or I'm taking it back to radical honesty, Massad has this great line about creativity that it's like energy. Creatives aren't these people that sit there magically coming up with things out of nowhere. Creatives are, all the answers exist out there. Creatives are just people who are incredibly adept at seeing those signals, reading them, and putting those two things together. And being honest, being radically honest, is something that allows for real, genuine human connection. And if we put those two pieces together, if we take an example of like a, a romantic relationship, we all know the relationship. Honesty is the basis of a good, strong relationship, and that's because you're creating the relationship with the reality of the person in front of you based in the reality of the world around you instead of the reality of the person you want them to be in the world that you would love it to be. And just like a relationship, creativity is not creating something out of nowhere. It's putting pieces together that already exist for a greater output. And when we do that grounded in reality, that is when we have the potential to actually create and change the future. So, he, again, as Massad likes to say, it's taking the pressure off creating the solutions and simply actually finding them. And as soon as we forget this element of being honest with ourselves, of challenging people, of challenging ourselves in these moments, that's when those antennas stop functioning. We're still the same people, but we lose the ability to pick up on those ideas that we're being fed by the universe constantly. Rick Rubin has this great line where, if anyone who doesn't know, amazing music producer, if you've forgotten, Jay-Z, etc. He famously said the creatives are the people that can look at the world and know 
that no one knows. No one truly knows the answer. Great artists, whether they know it or not, they see the world for what it truly is, and they sit in the reality of what it truly is. And I'm not one, so I can say it. It's probably why it's really sad and quite hard and real to be these creatives, because they have to live in the reality of the world, not the version they want for the person they want to be. But here for you guys today is where it all changes. After all, everything we've heard, we know we can't move forward behaving the same that we have so far. And whether you guys like it or not, for any creatives in this room, not only do we need to do this because of the planet dying, but also, guys, I'm afraid AI is coming for us. So if we don't do this, we're out of a job anyway, if we're still alive. But the question is, how do you do it? Because I can tell you, as someone who's trying to do it, under Masad's guidance, it is something that is so difficult. It's embarrassing, it's painful, it's hard, but fundamentally, it is liberating. And it all comes back to that very, very simple feeling that you all sat in for two minutes earlier. You have to look for that feeling, and when you recognize it, you have to sit in it. The more you look for it, the more easily you will find it. But you have to go back to that feeling. You have to lean into it, and you have to create in that space, that discomfort, that challenge, that honesty. And it's awful. Don't hide behind the illusions of complex language. We all do. We all know our sentences get longer when we're less and less sure about the answer we're trying to give. Stop it. Stop trying to hide behind that. Use simple, use clear language because you know that you're being honest with yourself about and honest with others about what the answer is. It's kind of like a scary film. You kind of have to, you know it's horrible and you know it's uncomfortable, but you just have to be okay with it. That's essentially what we're trying to aim towards. Sit in it, create in it. Again, Masad says this line, and it's a wonderful line. It's that beneath these stories that we're trying to take, the, we're, well, the stories we're trying to tell ourselves and everyone about these stable, sensible lives we have. Fundamentally, we are all an utterly irrational mess of ever-changing and often conflicting and embarrassing beliefs and feelings. But I know, for me, that world sounds a whole lot more exciting than any other version of it. So let's just be honest about it. Let's stop trying to tidy it up, and let's use it to change the world. Because if we don't create from a space of radical honesty, there is no way we can expect to radically shift our reality. So guys, I'd like to say thank you so much. I'd like to say thank you to Masad for the ideas, but thank you guys for listening. Have a lovely afternoon. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. Take that liquid death off the stage. They didn't pay a penny for this. <laughs> Thanks. So um, through all our time at A Plastic Planet, which is six years now, uh, the last two of which, as you can imagine, has been designing and building and creating the content for Plastic Free. But we, we get asked a lot of questions. What is the best compostable coffee cup? Is it really possible for us to live without plastic? What about healthcare? Surely you want plastic in healthcare, Sean. Um, what, what would I do? if I couldn't have a bottle that is a colored plastic, because my bottle is my brand. These are the questions that we get the entire time. Oh, another one of mass, I'd bless. Um, but fundamentally, that isn't the question that anybody should be asking. The real question that I keep wanting to go back to people and say, it's not about the compostable coffee cup. It's not about your bottle. It's not even just about the, the clothes that we wear, the buildings that we're in. It's so much more systemic than that. So our panel now is going to be some extraordinary people where I really want to talk about this thing of systems change. Because the real question is this. How are we going to live? How are we going to change from this toxic, degenerative, pollutive, exploitative cul-de-sac that we find ourselves in, in such a very, very short space of time, and live in a completely different way. So I'd like to welcome these four marvelous people to the stage. Joss Harrison again, Ben Parker, Celine Seman, and Amanda Parks. <laughs> I'll get you back. Has everybody got a mic? Have you got a mic? Right. Yeah, he needs a mic. Joss, thank you so much for earlier. 
Now I want to give you the opportunity to talk a little bit about what you're doing at Reckitt, because uh, uh, you know, we work with the, the Unilevers and the P&Gs and some of those big CPGs, and it, it really struck me, here is somebody at the heart of a massive business, knows they're part of the problem, but is trying to reinvent it from the inside out and move the business, perhaps from selling more and more stuff, to this systems change of rethinking how you're going to sell stuff. First, it's not about selling stuff. I think that's the first thing we've got to, got to understand. Every opportunity, especially as creatives, every opportunity to interact with someone, with an individual, is not an opportunity to sell them something. If we're in the business of building brands and building equity into our brands as, as CPG businesses, then the inherent value exchange in that connection isn't always going to be a fiscal one. So I think that's, that's the first step. Try to think about building relationships with people that will build your brands. Um, and the second point sticks with the, this notion of fiscal growth. So I mentioned earlier about the, the growth mindset. The assumption with this concept of a growth, growth mindset tends to be that it, in, it is inherently physical growth. So more products, greater scale, etc. Now, for businesses to continue to be successful and to have the positive impact that we all believe they should and can, um, that growth need only be fiscal growth. So we need to think about the business models that we employ as gigantic brand owners, there's plenty of us in here, um, that drive towards continued fiscal growth and ongoing enablement of whatever positive effect we've chosen for that brand or that business. Um, but moving away from this physical growth, the, the deriving more raw materials, the constant distribution of things, of physical objects, perhaps. So the, the way that we solve people's problems has to therefore change. You know, we've, we saw your diagram earlier of, of circular uh, solutions, circular business models, if you like. To be genuinely circular, we've got to start to take up the, the possibilities of, for example, some of the suppliers that we've seen here today where circular means genuinely circular, not, oh, we just reduce it as much as we can and then, and then we throw away what's left. Uh, and so figuring out how to solve people's problems, which is essentially what we do as businesses, has to be dedicated to these kind of genuinely circular business models. If I can help someone solve their problem through provision of information, for example, fantastic. Maybe I don't need to sell them something on that particular occasion to, it, to continue solving their problem and for them to feel this, this brand genuinely cares about solving that problem that they, they want to overcome. So it's a bad attitude shift and I think this is why huge businesses like ours um, have to undergo a, a transformation because the, the, the way that we do business and have always done business is reliant on, these, on individual items, consumer units if you like, consumer balls. But we've got to figure out how to solve people's problems in a different way mm. and at enormous scale, which is why it's so interesting hearing some of these raw material suppliers talking about the, the complex ecosystems of alternative materials that can be created at scale, can be used at scale, and then can be returned to the soil at scale. It's awesome. Sh Sean, yeah. I really sorry, annoyingly. I, was getting, I know it was meant to be a panel discussion. Can I just add, we keep hearing this word consumer. Yeah. And, and uh, I think a really interesting point, if we look at the etymology of the word consumer, it actually means to waste or to squander. And I think that says it absolutely, uh, absolutely. on the nail. It says it all. Yeah. So, so Ben, let's, you've got your mic. Sorry. I'll turn to you. Um, so Ben, you know, obviously I've worked with you really closely for the last five years and then the two years on the creation of, of Plastic Free. And how has, how has this epiphany really happened for you of being somebody who's worked with so many of the luxury brands over your career. How do you feel about what you do now? Where do you see that role of the creative? I think it, it, there's an awakening. Um, I think for too long we've been looking at the surface of things. Uh, designers, I think, have been in the doldrums for, for decades. Um, I've been part of that problem and we need to come full circle to be part of the solution. Um, helping sell, you know, toxic ideas, poor ideals, uh, we've become experts at it, and we've forgotten actually the superpower that we actually have, which is to envision something differently and to, and to hold on to that vision. Um, you know, there's a 
number, a lot of beauty brands that we work with, um, everyone from Stella McCartney all the way through, um, who are doing remarkable things. But, you know, we've helped pump out a lot of plastic in our time. And I think we had our eyes wide shut, if that's the right expression to it. You know, we were too busy about making it look beautiful. Um, but we realised that the, it's the, what lies beneath. It's, we moved from the surface of things in the 20th century to the, to, to the systems that lie beneath in the 21st century. And actually, as creatives, that is really, really interesting because actually the surface can only take us so far and, and led, led us to where we are today. But as we look at the systems, and obviously Luke and Eric talking so, in such rich detail about from chemistry all the way through to a systemic change, how can creatives be a part of that? It opens up our... Our, our, our world in such an interesting and fascinating way. Celine, let me turn yes, to you. Yes, I wanted to jump in on that. Good, that's lucky, because I've got a question for you. <laughs> then it's you. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, it's, as we said, pollution is by design. Uh, I work in primarily in climate justice, and you know, oftentimes we think that climate justice is scientists and uh, anthropologists and folks that are you know have a PhD and and so on. But what we are trying to get in the movement of climate justice are designers, are the creatives, because really the solution has to be thought of. It's it, it has to be thought of outside of the current ways that we are creating. Things. So we definitely need the creatives, we need the designers, and as we said, pollution is by design, so design is inherently part of the solution. And so working outside of the silos that these systems have created, separating scientists from policymakers, from designers, from creatives, you know, and working across all of these different industries is what, you know, Slow Factory has been uh, in, in mandated to do by ourselves only, which is basically breaking down the walls that exist between all of these industries, getting folks that are working in automotive, in the, with the automotive industry, working side by side with designers, working side by side with waste collectors, waste management uh, folks. And, and that is important because that is where we spark the creativity. We spark the imagination to understand the system because we can say systemic change all day long. It is a very nice idea, but we definitely need to be able to experience it, to live it. Are you optimistic? I love the way that you bring science and art and design and business together and you use culture and education to push everything forward. Are you feeling an optimism? Is, is business listening? I feel like the more we do, the more we get our hands dirty, the more we get out there in the front lines, uh, in the ring, getting our ass beat up and standing back up again and doing it again, getting ourselves, you know, rubbing, ru uh, you know, rubbing the feathers, whatever, um, getting, you know, becoming the troublemakers, the good troublemakers and coming back and coming back, that's what gives me hope, you know? For example, it's in the action of doing the things. It's in the way that we are seeing communities come together, that we are seeing it in the faces of our students when we are providing them tools, speaking about the elephant in the room that no one wants to talk about, which is, you know, all of these systems of extractions, they are because of white supremacy, they are because of the racism of making pollution legal. You know, we work with a lot of indigenous mm -hmm. scholars that really challenge this idea of pollution being legal. It's legal. It's legal to seize land and to b build a hole in it and to toss all of the things that could be reused, but no one cares to look into these systems because they're expensive. But we are okay subsidizing fossil fuel, subsidizing the raping of our planet, but not subsidizing the work that requ is required around waste led design solutions? Why, yeah. you know? These have all been dirty little secrets, I feel. I mean, you know, the, the whole waste management industry, how it is legal for us to export such a vast percentage of our waste to developing countries that have no infrastructure to deal with it. Offshoring, I mean, it, it's, it's waste imperialism, isn't it? So all of these things, that, the good thing is we're talking about them now, and they have been going on for decades. In, in the dark, so at least we're now airing them. And of course, we have things like the UN Global Plastics Treaty, because you're right, plastics is a, it's a human rights issue. It's not just a pollution issue. It's so much bigger in every single way. So Amanda, I want to turn to you, because obviously you work with Pangaea. I bet everybody here, if they don't own a piece, they aspire to own a piece <laughs> of Pangaea. And you guys have always been ahead. And really 
thinking of yourself rather than a fashion brand, I think. You've always talked about Pangaea as being, you're about material science and pushing that agenda, but always making it something that is so aspirational. Tell us, tell us a little bit, what's in sure. your pipeline? Yeah, and I think my lead-in from, from Celine is action. This idea that Pangaea was an action-oriented response to a lot of things that we were seeing in the world. And yes, we manifest in the world mostly as a fashion brand, but at our core, you know, deep under the water, if the tip of the iceberg is what you're seeing, um, we are an R&D company working collaboratively. <laughs> that's, mm -hmm. that's also a key word. And I think, you know, you say we've always done this. We're only three years old. So that, that's one of the things to also think about with all these movements is how, like, we're really still at the very, very beginning of so many of these things, but that's, which is exciting. Um, so Pangaea is, born from this idea that we can have, we can change the business model of what a sort of fashion brand um, is. And that's, you know, it's a response to seeing, I, I come from the more of the traditional tech industry as well as academia and seeing, you know, big, um, big tech companies for all their problems, there's some things we can learn from them. They own the means of their own production. So thinking about Apple and Google inventing the code and the hardware that they need to determine the future of their own industry. They invent their own future, and that's not what's ha what happens with big fashion brands. So why don't we own the material culture and the means of production of our own textiles and of our own raw materials inside of fashion and have a bigger voice in it? Um, also comes from the idea that the Silicon Valley model is broken, where I spent a lot of time, work, you know, both from academia and working, founding startups and working with startups and watching all the wrong things get funded. And this is sort of, you know, back in the mm -hmm. era of... We, had, we were making apps to fix apps to fix apps, you know, and uh, no actual long-term, you know, world-changing um, things were getting funded because it wasn't, didn't have a three-year return on investment, right? So how do we, so I wanted, you know, we, we actually started as a fund <laughs> and, to, and, you know, having um, someone like, you know, the team was from different parts of industry, finance, you know, media, fashion, and science, to have those different people at the table deciding what's gonna get funded. And Pe the Pengaya's brand grew out of wanting to show the different fashion industry players that you c we can meet these startups like Luke, right, halfway to get responsible, beautiful product into the industry quickly. And also, you know, that we can play different roles. We can collaboratively work on things. We have our own R&D going on. We have, you know, research with at universities. We have um, collaborations with startups where we might invest. We will do, um, you know, we'll do basically a product development together and instead of competitively, right? And this idea of, of that sharing and getting the product out in, with, a, with our kind of successful brand and e-commerce platform and marketing. And then also from the perspective of we also, the things we develop, we want to share with the industry. We have B2B on the back end to start spreading. And that's just getting off the ground. Um, and then the last part of our experimental business model was around communications. You just heard from our agency. Um, but thinking, like talking about science transparently, transparently not um, you know, using the technical words, but being very, very careful to explain them properly, um, you know, being clear about what we are able to do and what we have not yet done, and the, but showing that we have a path there. So. Yeah, that level of transparency, which is why you know, I really enjoy hearing from people like Joss of, of saying, we, we know that we've got to move, it's just, yeah. and how do you persuade the stakeholders? So your whole thing of fundraising being such an issue because the, it, all we need to do here is move the money. That's where we yes, have power with our wallets. The yes. <laughs> move the money, put your pension somewhere that is not investing in fossil fuels. If we can start to do things like that, we can see things, everything will crumble. Yeah. Very, and the decision makers on the money, because you know, yeah. I've been in a lot of rooms with old white men who make all the decisions about money. Totally <laughs> agree. But we're gonna, we're gonna end with a note of optimism. Yeah. So I'd like to whistle around and say to each of you, tell us something that you are really excited about for the future. Easy, this. Aww. I think gathering uh, creative professionals and aspiring creative professionals, not just within the creative industry, as I said at the start, engineers, scientists, people whose mindset is, as Ben said earlier, imagining what that future might be, how it might be different. And having a platform like this to, to enable them to collaborate it just elevates the impact that we can have as creatives to change all of these things that we've been talking about and hearing about. It's, this is exactly what the, the business world and the world at large needs, is ways to collaborate, ways to apply and amplify creativity. Um, I guess I would say kind of the future of biology and that we're in this fourth industrial revolution where everything around unlocking the potential of 
what we can do with understanding the natural world is finally being applied in appropriate ways that you know nature is not over there and product and urbanism is here um, so it's biomimicry it's models around biofabrication and just like the expansion of the incorporation of nature into our living world as a reality check i know that this is a very informed room but i'm excited about the idea of kind of spreading that idea globally I would echo that I'm very excited about bacteria. Um, yes. <laughs> and bacteria are the unsung heroes of biodiversity. And we uh, are working with these solutions at the Slow Factory Labs, focusing deeply on bacteria as a way to explore breaking down plastic, building new materials, and living in a world where we are in harmony with bacteria. I love that one. Um, Everyone said so, such good answers. Um, I think it's about uh, creatives really stepping up and knowing that the power that they have and this incredible creative renaissance that we're in. And if we look back at the original renaissance, um, you know, it wasn't the religious elite and it wasn't sort of political leaders that were driving the change. It was an uprising from architects, musicians, artists, poets, writers. It was empowered by them. And I think that's a really exciting example that actually, right now, if there's 160 million creatives on the planet, how much power do we have to change everything? Because um, everything we touch is, is a piece of design. Um, yeah, so even I, if it's a bad design, it's had a creative process. So that's my answer. I love it. Guys, thank you so much. Thank, thank you very you much. Thank you so much. Joss, Ben, Celine, and Amanda. This is why we're here. We are here to realize that what we've got is the most wonderful, beautiful, nurturing, safe home that every single thing that we do, every minute of the day has to be fighting to protect it. To start, just as Ben was talking about, this new, powerful renaissance. And it is only the creative industry that can create, paint, imagine this new future that we can then, as the business people of the world, the money people of the world, can then build a roadmap to. Because if we don't have that vision, clearly communicated, unified by you, we can't build that roadmap. We're all in a vacuum. We're all lost. And funny that we had that wonderful quote from Brian, because I wanted to leave you with an even shorter one, straight from Greta. Hope is a verb. It's a doing word. It's an action word. So when you're thinking about hope, it is not some ethereal thing of, that we have no control over. Think of it as something you get up and you act every single day on. And when you're doing these actions, remember this. I love these visuals, and it's from an incredible book called How to Be a Good Ancestor. And that first little circle is the dead, the 100 billion that have gone before us. And then the eight billion, that little yellow dot, is obviously the living. So when you think about the actions that you're taking, the career paths, the business decisions, the world that you are trying to create ahead, remember that unlike any other generation, what we do in the next seven years doesn't just impact my kids, your kids, maybe our grandkids. No, it's going to impact that massive orange circle of the unborn, the trillions of people that have not even been conceived yet, the, the stardust that will be borrowed back that we will when we have passed on. Like no other generation ever on the planet, we are going to impact them. So know the power that you have in every single decision that you make right now. And then my call to action as everybody says in the marketing terms, my call to action for you is join us. We can't do this alone. We need you, we need all of you, and we need you to now be the disciples that go out and tell 10 people we need to join this movement. I think this quote sums everything up. There is one thing stronger than all the armies in the world, and that is an idea whose time has come. We believe the time has come for Plastic Free, the movement that we want you all to join. 
Because, yeah, we need you. We cannot do this alone. We've spent two years building this. It's not some beautiful temple to live in the desert alone. It needs all of you to fuel it, use it, be part of it, create through it. And then we know that together, in this one plus one, the James Webb Magnification Telescope, we have created something that is above anything we ever believed that we could have the power to do. So finally, I'm going to ask you to get your phones out. And I'd like you all to do one thing, which is scan this. Am I in the way? Scan this. Simply sign up to say that you are interested in joining the movement. We just need your email. We're never going to spam you. We're not those kind of people. The other thing I'd love is then also we can tell you when this entire event is going to be streamed um, via Dezine, so we can keep you informed of that. And then I just want to thank everybody. I want to thank the incredible team here at Parsons. I want to thank the, the team who have been filming everything, so caring so much about it all. I want to thank our amazing speakers, and I want to thank you guys for extending your stay here, being so attentive. I rarely saw the little light of a phone illuminating a face. You've done an incredible job. Thank you for everything. Join the movement. Plastic Free is the gateway to us fixing that climate crisis. Trust me on that. And I hope that you feel a little different. As Tom was saying, you've got, to have, you've got to feel it. I'm hoping that you are changed. You know things now that you will never unknow. Thank you. I want to invite all the speakers to come up. <laughs>